Welcome back everybody. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can use the background tile replacement scripts in GB Studio, some of their downsides and their limitations, and also some ideas for you to implement them into different games of your own. So as you can see here, I've basically expanded the grid from the free by free that I had in the last video, and I've now made it so it fits on the 10 by 10. Um, but I've only made it so it works when I place a boat and puts it on the background in the A to E columns. And I did the F, but then it told me that there was too much data in the scene. And I'll talk about how you can get around that uh, later. Um, but basically, as you can see, I've got this two sized boat and it's just being placed. Um, and I'll now talk to you about the specifics of it uh, so that you can hopefully get a grasp of how you might uh, do it in your games as well. So to begin, I made my scene have unique tiles. So obviously a scene can only have like 200 unique tiles. It says the number of unique tiles it has in the scene right here. And so every single one of these, to make sure that they are unique, I just put zero to 99 in there. So that's 100 unique tiles. Um, and then I have a scene over here. So this scene, is what the script will be referencing in order to replace those 0 to 99 tiles with um, to make it look like there are boats here. So I have a spreadsheet set up that I've deconstructed uh, everything that I need for the boat. So if we have a look here, the ship number one, so ship one, it only needs the um, bottom and top and then the left and right, depending on whether it's horizontal or vertical. And then I also have a value here that is for if it's hit. So when I place the boat, I'm basically saying if it needs to be either a bottom, a top, a left, or a right, or when we get to it, it will be a hit. Um, and all of these are within this amount of range so that it's not just holding on to what it looks like, it's also holding on to the, the actual ship. Basically what I'm trying to solve here is the fact that I need two values in one variable. I need to know what the, what the actual tile looks like and also which ship it is. So I can't just use the same, uh, you know, top end, bottom end for all of the ships because I'm actually storing that value in order to display it correctly and to be referenced when the attacker attacks that ship. So it might not make sense to you um, because it's hard to explain, but basically I've split, split it up into the different boats so that we can, we know which boat it is when we're firing at it, okay? So if we scroll down into this code, then I've basically taken the code from the free by free setup grid um, and I've just like refactored it for the 10 by 10 grid. So if we have a look at this uh, here, basically we press start and then if the boat is one, we know that it's the two, the size of two. Okay, so um, first of all, we just check if it's actually inside the grid. Um, and if it is inside the grid, then we continue. And if not, then it's like stopped and basically we can press start again. Then basically we, we take where the current position is of the player. So let's say it's A1. You can see at the very bottom of the thing here, there's a little highlighted uh, thing that says um, 10 by 10 grid setup X equals seven, Y equals five. So basically you see these values here, I'm minusing six and I'm minusing four. So basically I'm turning this seven, five into a one, one. Um, by subtracting those values, I'm, I'm getting it down to the actual, you know, X, Y value of the grid. So first of all, when we find X and obviously X is the A column. So we find X and then one is A. And so I've obviously told it's A here, B, C, D, E. And like I said, I got to F, but once I tested that, it was too much data. So I've, I've just set it to um, disabled for now. Um, and I'll talk about how I would introduce the rest of the rows, even though it's hitting the data limit in a second. So on row A, we're, we're basically then saying find Y. So then on one, it's obviously, this will be A1. So then if it's A1, um, basically we just want to check if, is there a boat there already? And if there is, then we stop it like we did before. Um, and then depending on if it's horizontal or vertical, it'll check um, the B value to see if there's a boat there. And basically we're just checking to see if, if there are a boat in that position already. And if there is, we stop it from happening. And if there isn't, we set that value to, so you see here there's A1 
um, and B1, so that would be this and this, and we're setting it to 4 and 5. And if we have a look in this spreadsheet here, 5 is the right end and 4 is the left end. And if I go back to this grid here, if we count starting from 0, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you can see it's the left end and number 5 is the right end. So these values here are referencing this tile set and the spreadsheet that I've set up to make it easier for myself to reference it. Basically, we're just setting the A1 and B1 value to the correct um, dis like displaying of the left and right, and also making sure that it's within that range of boat one, because when we come to boat two, we will want it to have a different value because we want to make sure that we're we want to make sure that we're keeping in mind the fact that there are five boats in the very final version of the game, um, rather than just making it for one boat and making it that every time we hit, at least one of the games knows, you know, as we're connecting with the link cable, one of the games knows that there was a hit of a, s a certain boat. So when both of them hit, for example, on boat one, that means we know the boat is sunk. And we couldn't do that unless we actually know which boat we're hitting, okay? And then you may be wondering, how does it actually change these zero to 99 to the actual thing? So at the very beginning of the um, of this scene, you see this huge block of um, information here. I'll go. For, I'll actually deconstruct it for you in a second. But first of all, you have to make sure that you're setting the the variables to to something. Okay. I found that if if the variables aren't set anywhere in the entire game, then it actually won't let you run the. It won't let you build the project basically because it doesn't know what you're referring to. For example, let's say I had A1 here, which is obviously the top left of the grid. Um, and if I didn't set A1 to anything anywhere in the game, then it would think that A1 isn't a variable, which is an interesting, but once you know about it, it's, it's completely fine. So if you have a look here, you see I've got all the A's in this bit and I'm just setting them all to zero. And obviously I set all of them to zero. Um, and I've also got the second uh, bunch, which is the the defending one. So when we're attacking the defender, that's their variables, um, which I haven't got to at all yet. I've only done, you know, the first boat, half of the grid, but uh, I'll now deconstruct this for you, but I'll also first give you a link. So if you go on the GB Studio Central website, you'll find this animating background tiles uh, tutorial. And this is basically where I got the information for doing this from. There are like links on this to take you to places that explain things further, but there's still things even I don't understand that um, they don't quite tell you about. As you, um, you know, as you read through it, you'll probably have questions that aren't answered as well, but um, I'll give you what works for me and hopefully it will make, it will work for you as well. Um, but basically they give us as a, an example here of using VM replace tile XY. That's, that's the main thing that we're using here. And then setting the, the actual reference of where it is in the scene, so 14 and 9. And uh, this bank tile set is explained up here, and it should just be kept to zero um, if you only have one scene that you're referencing. And the same with this one here. And then this var loop index, it talks about the using variables. And like I already said, it can be, it doesn't always work depending on how you've set it up. So it took me a while to figure it out, but basically I put var and then underscore and then whatever the variable name that I called it is. So for example, A1. Um, I tried doing it with the, you know, the um, dollar sign and then zero, zero, whatever um, numbers it is, but that didn't work. So I definitely recommend naming things early and naming them correctly. Um, and so that it's easier for yourself to, to reference, especially when, for example, I'm using 200 variables um, for the, the first grid and then the second grid of the defenders. So yeah, I recommend reading through this, but I will break down how I'm doing it for you. Okay, so this bit highlighted here is a good explanation of how it works. So VM replace tile, uh, spelled exactly like this, and then XY, and then space, and then 75. So if we hover over this, we know that 75 is A1, and the bank tile says zero, tile says zero, and that's referring to this scene. And it basically means that the bank tile set and the tile set zero are the scenes that is built first because zero means first and then one is the next and two, three, four. Um, so we're referencing this scene. So tile set zero. And I put the exclamation mark like it suggests in that article so that it's built first. And then we have variable 
A1. So as we know, when we set that A1 to, for example, 4 and 5, then it's setting these two, or setting A1 to 4, for example. And now it means that it will display as this thing here. But we also need to remember we have a VM push constant here, which I'm not exactly sure what it does. I just know that they had it and it works when I have it. Um, and if we scroll down all the way here, we have VM pop one, which I think clears, like, uh, I don't know what it clears, but that's what they said that it does. But it, this works for me, so a VM pop one, right? And the same at the top, it's the, uh, the VM push constant one. Um, and so this happens at the very start when the values are zero. And you know, when it's zero, it actually does this one. And it actually, the scene tiles that are unique stay unique, even when you set them to the same tile, okay? So, so it means that if we set all of them to the same tile, they still stay unique. So that means we can still use this exact script later down the line. So uh, that means after we set the new value, so for example, the four and the five here, that means after we set that find X and find Y, we can then play this exact uh, script again, and it will update and show the new tiles in it. So that's basically how it works. It is quite complicated and requires you to do a lot of planning and the script itself, the, the fact that um, if I was to rename variable, the, you know, the A1 variable, I have to go through every VM script that I have got using this and change that. Um, I could technically use a custom script and have this in it so that I could change it once and it would change everywhere, but that would probably be smarter. Um, but luckily I only have it like at the start of the scene and then at the end of the scene. By reading this article on GB Studio Central, you'll find out about, you know, the specifics of, you know, how to set it up. And I definitely recommend doing that because having the information right in front of you is probably better than me telling you it. So I'll put this uh, link in the description. So if you do want to use the VM tile replacement script, then um, definitely read this first. Um, you might understand it better than I do. There's links in it to um, more explanations and more, you know, tutorials even. So yeah, definitely recommend that. Just know that I have made it work, so I think you can too. So if we go back to the actual game here, you can see that I can move the, the boat around. I'm using top-down 2D so that it always stays within the 8x8 grid. And if we press enter, it's checking is there a boat already in this location? And if there isn't, it then sets, for example, C9 and E9, or so D9, to the 4 and 5 value so that it will be there. And then obviously when I pre try and press on this one, it knows that there's already a boat in that in that position. Um, and currently, obviously, I'm just making it so there's boat, just this two-shaped boat, um, just for testing, so I can easily see if I've done something wrong inside the code, and then I can easily go back and fix it. Um, but you can see how I can set the tiles, and I can make it seem like I'm actually placing stuff on the grid, when technically I'm just replacing parts of the grid with new uh, tiles. But the great thing is the information is actually stored somewhere of what is in the tile. And I talked about before the fact that there's actually too much data in the scene. Um, so if we look in this X thing, I've just enabled um, f the, this um, find F. So um, if we look in the build and run, I've just pressed build and run and you can see the, it says the object file too large to fit in bank. So that's what happens when there's too much data in one scene or on one thing. So for example, this is the initiate. So this is the scene information. But if I had on an actor or maybe even a um, trigger, for example, so if, imagine I entered a trigger and then it put this start thing on here. And then I had another one that would do the F to J. So that could be a way that I get around that problem. Or if there's still too much um, information in the scene itself, I would have to split it up into two scenes. So when I click on this, it sends me to another scene, which does all the work in for one half, and then it sends me to another scene that does the work for the other half, um, which is obviously very complicated. And unless you're making a grid-based game that has a um, hundred tiles in it, I don't imagine that you would do that. I got to 50 technically, okay? So think about that as your limit of what you can do on one thing, but I wouldn't even recommend that because it's just so repetitive to you know, do things over and over again. I would maybe suggest having, you know, 16, that might be a, a, a nicer amount. Um, or 25 is another, like 16 is seems low, 25 might be on the edge of the 
annoying. But if you had multiple scenes, for example, if you're making a farming game, you could easily have time go by and it update the tiles with new um, growing animations, like in Stardew Valley or something. Um, that's definitely possible in this. Obviously, I'm not. I don't think you can replace the entire scene. Like if you wanted to update and display, you know, full scenes basically then obviously you can't really do that because the limit is 200. If we think about the fact that there's 20 by 18 tiles that's 360 tiles like unique in the whole scene maybe you could do you know like the top quarter or a bar in the middle could be how you update it uh, and make something like a more interesting game but I would still you know question how much data you can fit in one scene. Um, so yeah definitely keep that in mind if you're thinking about using this yourself. I recommend keeping it small. You can obviously have like one-off things in your scenes that are just uh, automatically updating constantly, which would be a cool idea. You know, like plants moving or background tiles that move like waterfalls, like in the tutorial. But yeah, if you're gonna do something like this, then definitely think about how you can optimize it and not go overboard with the amount of data in a single scene. The great thing about this um, setting up, you know, boats is that it's a slow process that the player has like a choice and they're not too worried. Um, if they have to, you know, take their time with it, you know, if, if I have to send them to another scene, they probably wouldn't care that much. But if it's a, imagine a platformer, imagine you jump on a platform and it takes you to a new scene, it, it might be a bit uh, janky, you know, so um, yeah, definitely think about how you, it, it works with your own specific game idea. But yeah, I'm definitely um, confident that I can get this um, whole idea of game or this whole game done. Um, I'm thinking of trying to make it not be called Battleship and instead be called something else and maybe even, you know, putting it up as an actual game. I'm not sure, you know, what actually is copyrighted when it comes to um, the Battleship game because it existed before Battleship existed. I would have to think about that and uh, talk to someone about making an actual game. Obviously, it wouldn't be called Battleship if it called something else. But yeah, I definitely recommend reading that article and any subsequent links that it has to more information, you'll definitely learn more than just by listening to me because I don't actually know um, exactly what is going on. All I know is this is how it works and this is, you know, the, the little things to replace it with if you want it to work with your specific case. So definitely ask in the, you know, the Discord and the Reddit as well if you get stuck um, or if you want more information, you know, like asking questions helps everybody. But yeah, I really hope this was inspiring in some way to you guys. So I'll put my patrons up on screen right now. Thank you so much to you guys. You guys are the best. Remember to like the video if you like the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. Let me know what you thought of this video. And if you're excited to see what I'm actually able to do with this um, concept. I remember at the first video I said, I'm not sure if it's even possible. And even now, I'm, I feel like I'm pushing the limits because of just like the, the problems I'm encountering. For example, like the, the scene in a data limit, right? I don't know if I'm just doing it very unoptimized or what, but um, yeah, it's definitely frustrating when I hit those walls and I have to try and spend some time to figure out how I'm gonna fix it. And on that though, I'll say thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.